Thank you, Brenda, for the kind introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today, I'm very excited for being here to discuss some of the regulatory and scientific considerations when we develop bioequivalent approaches for long-acting drugs. Please note that this presentation only reflects the view of mine and should not be construed to represent FDA's views or policies. First, a bit background on long-acting drugs. They are generally designed to uh, reduce dosing frequency, provide a more stable PK profile, reduce potential side effects, and improve patient compliance. In terms of uh, the dosage form, we can roughly divide them into three categories. The first one is oil-based injectable solutions. The second one is suspensions. Within this category, we can further divide them into nano suspensions, which contains only the API solid particles without any carrier, and microparticles, which are made of either lipids or polymers. Then the third category includes inserts and implants, such as uh, intrauterine systems, intravagina rings, um, preformed solid implants, as well as uh, in situ forming implants. So except the oil-based injectable solution, uh, all the rest of long-acting drugs are considered as uh, complex drug products. So despite tremendous interest in developing generic long-acting drugs, so far we do not have any generic on the US market. Most of these drug products, they have very complicated formulation design, involve use of uh, complex and non-compendial recipients are very sensitive to small process and raw material changes. The characterization of a finished product can be very difficult, and it may take longer time to develop uh, in vitro drug release assay for quality control purposes or other purposes because there is no standardized method available. The release mechanisms are not fully understood. And compared uh, to the more conventional dosage forms, uh, bioequivalent study design for long-acting drugs are generally much more complicated. So what are uh, general regulatory and scientific considerations when we're developing bioequivalence guidance? From a regulatory perspective, if a product is for parenteral, ophthalmic, or autic use, then by regulation, generic product needs to have the same inactive ingredients in the same amount, so-called qualitative Q1 and quantitative Q2 thinness of the recipient. Uh, pharmaceutical equivalence is a requirement for all generics. Uh, but when a product has a complex API study already presented, then we may have uh, additional recommendation on the in vitro characterization needs to be done on the API thinness in the PSG. For scientific consideration, when we develop uh, bioequivalence guidances, we reference the development history of the reference product. We study the uh, safety efficacy profiles as well as the relevant literature. So we have to determine what is the most appropriate study population, uh, healthy volunteers versus patients, whether the study is a single dose or it has to be at steady state, uh, can bioequivalence be determined based on pharmacokinetic endpoints or clinical endpoints, or both sometimes? Then for complex drugs, we often run into situations where, well, uh, in vivo studies uh, may not be sufficient or sometimes uh, practically infeasible. So that will require us to look into alternative approaches, such as in vivo studies in combination with in vitro studies, or sometimes in vitro studies uh, only. So in the next uh, few slides, uh, I'm going to discuss some examples to elaborate more on this consideration. So the first example is polymer-based uh, microparticles. To date, FDA has approved 17 polymer-based microparticles. Most of them are made of polylactic co-glycolic acid, PLG copolymer. So except one product, all the rest, microspheres, are parenteral drug products. Therefore, by regulation, generic products need to demonstrate Q1, Q2 thinness of the recipient, including PLGA polymers. 
You see, I put a set phase here. Why? PLG is a class of polymer which are available in a wide range of the monomer ratio, molecular weight, weight distribution. There are also two different polymer structures. Despite the fact PLG polymers have been most commonly used to formulate depot formulations, um, is there is just not enough uh, characterization on the polymer themselves to clearly answer how similar is similar enough to define two PLG polymers as Q1 the same. So the reverse engineering, and on top of that, the properties of the PLG can be significantly altered during manufacturing. So what to do? How to really assess Q1, Q2 similarities of PLG, and how to decide which polymer to use when you, you know, like to develop a generic product. So thankfully, you know, with the implementation of a GUDUFA, we have resource now to really do some research to close out this remaining scientific gap. So about uh, seven, five, six, six years ago, we uh, used the you know research as a rescue, and we have funded a series of research projects in the area of long-acting drug products. So today, I'm going to highlight uh, three. Uh, publications focusing on developing new analytical methods to characterize PLG polymers. With the time constraint, I will not be able to dive into the technical detail. My goal here today is to bring those publications to your attention so you are aware of them and can use them as a resource during development. So the first paper was published in 2015. It's a paper about a protocol for assay PLG in clinical products. So in this paper, we described the methods to determine molecular weight, weight distribution, altitude ratio, and end cap group of PLG, linear PLG polymers. We studied two commercial products as a model product. So while working on this project, uh, when the research team was doing reverse engineering on TrialStar, which is available as three strengths for one month, three months and six, six months drug delivery. The team developed a hypothesis, which is that the six months formulation may contain actually more than one kind of PLG. So back then, you know, there were uh, literature Hi. researches Stormy. done by, done by, uh, oh. sorry. That's kind of tough to ignore, isn't it? So there were literature reports on using blends of PLG to achieve desired drug release kinetics, but there was no study done on separating PLG mixtures when used in the same product. Honestly, when we first had this hypothesis and decided to develop a new project, we had a lot of uncertainty and we have a lot of a lot more questions than answers. But we, had, we are fortunate to have really wonderful collaborators and very dedicated working on, you know, closing out these uh, tough scientific gaps. So after three years of hard work this year, we published the very first paper reporting how to separate PLG based on L2G ratio when they are used as a mixture in the same product. So the third paper I'd like to highlight here is about characterizing branched glucose PLG polymer used in sandal studying LAR. For people who work in this field, you must know this polymer is, is fair, is compared to the linear one, it's a fairly new, relatively new and less studied polymer. So really there's not a lot of information on how to properly characterize this polymer. So this is, in this paper, we report on characterizing the glucose PLG star polymer using a method which is not reference standard dependent. In addition to study the polymer extracted from sandal setting LAR, we are trying to be proactive and we have also evaluated glucose PLG polymers from all suppliers in the US and compared them to the polymer extracted from the brand product. So my colleague Dr. Bing Qing will provide a lot more detailed information 
on this project in uh, the next presentation. So the second example is about a long-acting injectable suspension. Compared to uh, PLG-based microparticles, reverse engineering and Q1, Q2 uh, establishment of long-acting injectable suspensions is fairly straightforward. That's why you see a happy face here. So we have, uh, so far we have posted uh, three product-specific guidances for long-acting injectable suspensions, and all of them are for antipsychotic indications. So we recommend to conduct a B study using multiple uh, dose steady state in patients who are already uh, at an established dosing regimen based on safety concerns. So, and then because of the, due to ethical concerns, we do not recommend to switch between different drugs and also involve naive patients. So, in the meanwhile, you know, we post the guidance to reflect our current understanding, but the story do not, does not end here. We do recognize there are still some unique challenges associated with our current recommendation. The recommended steady state in patients means the study is very long and the population potentially have very high dropout rate, which leads to a large number of subjects to provide sufficient power for BE study. So what to do? Whether there are any alternative approaches, and you may have already known, we have revised the PSG for triamcinol acetonide injectable suspension to include an in vitro based totality of evidence approach. So why this hasn't been adopted for long-acting injectable suspensions? What are the differences between long-acting suspensions versus other injectable suspensions? So here are some of our thoughts. The prolonged in vivo application duration and the antipsychotic indication of long-acting injectable suspension present a higher risk compared to injectable suspensions for short-term use, such as catalog 40, catalog 10. So, but then we are not trying to stop here or justify why, not, why we are not adapting, ad adopting the, the in vitro only approach. Currently, we have an ongoing research project trying to address the following three questions. First, what are the critical quality attributes of long-acting suspensions? How these characteristics correlate with in vitro and in vivo release, and how in vitro drug release testing correlates uh, with in vivo bioavailability. So hopefully, you know, uh, in near future, we'll have more uh, scientific evidence to allow us to further explore alternative approaches. So the third example here is multivesicular liposomes. So this is a relatively new complex dosage form Multivesicular liposomes, they are called liposomes because they have the characteristic lipid bilayer liposomal structure. But they are actually microparticles made of lipids, but with a very unique honeycomb inner structure. So in the guidance, so because, and they also they are designed for local action. So because of the complexity, in the guidance uh, we posted for Bupivacan multivesicular liposome, in addition to the PK study, we are also recommending the applicants to, to, to conduct additional in vitro studies to ensure equivalent uh, lip, liposome characteristics uh, to characterize the inner external structure to determine the in vitro drug release rates. While working on the guidance development, we realized that there is not a lot of public information available on how to properly characterize the structure of this group of uh, products. And also, there is very limited information on how to develop a drug release method. So in the past two years, ORS has been collaborating with scientists in Office of uh, Testing and Research, as well as scientists in the NanoCore lab in CDRH, focusing on developing advanced uh, analytical methods for characterizing the structure of MVLs and also develop a novel in, uh, in vitro drug release assay. So this year, uh, we have published uh, our preliminary findings in the Journal of Control Release to probe the mechanism of uh, bupivacan drug release 
from multivesicular liposomes. So in the paper, we discussed the potential release mechanisms and using advanced imaging techniques as a support, supporting tool. And we also developed a novel in vitro release testing method, which is able to do uh, inline measurement while doing the release. So the fourth and the last uh, example I have here is intrauterine systems. We have four intrauterine systems currently on the US market with uh, application duration ranging from three years to five years. Conducting an in vivo BE study for multiple years is just uh, practically infeasible. So what to do? Our current thinking on how to establish by occurrence of intrauterine system is that if a test, IUS, is determined to be Q1 and Q2 similar to the RD and has an equivalent physical dimension, then its bioequivalence can be demonstrated by showing comparative physical, chemical, and mechanical characteristics, comparative in visual drug release profile throughout the intended period of drug product use and comparative short-term in vivo study, ex vivo study, by determining the residual amount of levonal gesture. So this approach will cut down the in vivo study time from multi-years to 12 months or less, which is significant. But we do recognize you know, the in vivo drug release testing is still potentially very time, is still very time consuming and potentially problematic. So again, we are using the GDUFA research program um, to fund a project trying to develop accelerated release testing method as well as real time. So hopefully the accelerated method can be sensitive, robust, and discriminatory to detect uh, manufacturing formulation differences and also can correlate with the real time release. So the ultimate goal is, if possible, then we can potentially also consider using an accelerated in vitro drug release testing to support our equivalence. So here are some pre, uh, one publication focusing on the manufacturing and formulation characterization, as well as some preliminary results on the accelerated solution testing. So in summary, um, here uh, I try to bring out some of the regulatory and scientific considerations uh, when we develop a product-specific guidance for long-acting drug. So if you did not know much about how the process of developing a guidance, so hopefully I have shined some light on the behind-the-scenes activities. And you recognize you know, we actually put a lot of resources and efforts trying really to come up with a, most reasonable and up-to-date science-based approach. So the GDUFA research project has been very helpful for addressing the many scientific gaps. So please, we highly encourage you to pay attention to meeting abstracts, posters, and publications on outcomes of our GDUFA research projects. Then again, we develop the guidance, but you are the ones that are going to implement so we are open to novel alternative approaches for assessing bioequivalence of complex long-acting drugs. If you think you have enough information data to support an alternative approach, engage with us early and share your findings, thoughts, through either controlled co correspondences or uh, pre-ENDA meeting requests. With that, I would like to thank for your attention.